Well, joining me today on the Godcast is somebody who will be uh, very familiar to people from the North. It is comedian, actor, writer, um, radio host, undercover vegan, I understand. Walker, yeah. it's the one and only Justin Morris. Justin, how are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. We got Good. there, didn't we? After, we've had a few technical problems. We've got there. Yeah, we had a little bit of a technical problem. Uh, probably e easiest technical problem to resolve. Uh, I pulled the power out of the back of my computer. <laughs> That's not technical, is it? That's just stupidity. Well, it's, it's happened to us all. I mean, there's. I'm, I'm going to come on to kind of lockdown kind of comedy and stuff, but there's definitely some funny stuff going on, isn't there? Oh, yeah. You know, I've got one of these uh, round lights. Have you got one? Well, you've definitely got one. because these lights. Well, my, my daughter had one that she used for makeup, and I said, oh, that'd be all right for my podcast. <laughs> yeah. It was well, 99 from Home Bargains, so, you know. Well, I've gone for it, but not tonight, because I didn't realise we were video. We, the, the clips of this will go out, but I didn't realise that. I would have typed it up, but uh, that's homeschooling there, and that's my detritus there. So, uh, But normally I've got a green screen that I, I fling behind me, and... Um, all right. Got these big lights and everything to do to do stuff on sometimes. So um, what's normally on the green up. screen, Justin? What image is it? Well, I can do different ones really. Uh, I can do the, whichever company I'm performing for. I can do that. Right. But I think my favourite one is where you can you can video yourself walking in and out of the room, and then just play that behind you. So you're in the middle of a meeting, then you just walk in behind yourself. <laughs> like it. Yeah. Justin, one of, one of the first questions I have on, on the Godcast is, have you been mm -hmm. to Burnley? Well, I know the answer because, one, I, I've seen you perform live at the Mechanics, and two, I met you mm -hmm. at Turf Moor uh, when yeah. United were playing. But what, was Burnley a good crowd? Yeah, uh, Burnley's been quite a significant part in my life, to be honest with you. I worked in Burnley for a, a, a significant uh, time. And uh, if I can be honest, it wasn't a happy time. Uh, I worked uh, at a firm in the town, and... Uh, had a boss that I did not like whatsoever. Right. And uh, <laughs> we'll leave it there. But uh, I, was, I worked in sales and uh, the, the, the local office was the Burnley office. Uh, and I lived in South Manchester. And this was, oh, we're going back now. This was before the, uh, the M60 was completed. So All right. you had to sort of like A-road it from Oldham, mm. uh, you know, to get on the M66. So, yeah, so I spent many a good time. But I, I always liked Burnley. I just didn't like that place. I just didn't like him. And uh, I liked everybody else I worked with, if I'm very honest. And he, he kind of clouded my vision of Burnley for a long time. And then I've been back a few times to do the mechanics and I've performed at Lower House Cricket Club. Yeah. And, uh, I've performed at Morehouse's Brewery. Right. Which uh, obviously I share I share a name with. Um, uh, and uh, I've been to Banny's Chippy quite often. <laughs> so The, the uh, one at Cone or the one in town, the new one? The drive through mate. The drive I mean, a drive through chip it, you know, it, it can't be beat for in, in my money. But the mechanics is 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 an inc incredibly good venue for me. I don't know what it is, but I think I just think it'd go down well in Burnley. I just think, mm. I think it's my kind of crowd. I think yeah. that's that's the truth of it. And um, you know, it's funny, like you say, I make it at Turf Moor. I've been to watch Man United at Burnley lots, you know, because it's a local. Uh, game and everybody wants to go to that game and um that's the play that that grounds the place i get recognized the most i get recognized more there at turf more than i do at old trafford <laughs> go on what are you doing here <laughs> well i remember because so, yeah, i was sat next to you for it. 20 minutes and you were getting a bit of dogs then but i think you i think yeah. you did stand up when burnley scored or something like that anyway no i didn't i did not <laughs> so I, where about you in, uh, in the <laughs> you were on the halfway line weren't you i think Yes, I was. I was yeah. with your sister, my brother, wasn't I? I well, it was, me, well, it was my, my brother and my sister-in-law. Justin, where, where, um, what year were we talking about when you were working in Burnley? Uh, well, I can say when I left, 1997, because that was right. the year my son was born, and uh, it was the year I quit <laughs> going to Burnley. Um, it was. It was a pay. I had a job with a pager. And then this pager that used to go off years ago. Do, 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 do. And if I hear it, I can hear it now, and it drives me crackers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, you know what, I was quite a frustrated person. I think like you, um, not as dramatic as you, but when you change paths in life, when you change directions, or just change lanes, you don't have to change directions. Sometimes you're going down 
one way you just decide to go a different way yeah i think there's always a period before that where you're sort of floating because you know there's some up but you don't know what it is and i think that was my time then for those mm. three or four years yeah i was lost but without knowing i was yeah so when did you start thinking about stand-up then was that shortly after or yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, this is the weird thing is that I love stand-up comedy and I, I loved um, performing, uh, sorry, I loved watching stand-up comedy at, the cl at clubs and I was a little bit of a Peter Kay and a Johnny Vegas kind of fan and I kind of really liked them and I followed them around and I used to go to the Frog and Bucket and I used to go to the the uh, the Buzz Club in Charlton and, and um, loved it. I loved comedy on telly and, you know, loved everything comedy I love you know I still do you know I've no interest in watching horror you know I'll always co comedy is my thing and um I didn't even consider being a comedian and I've always been quite gregarious and outspoken and ma ma mouthy I suppose <laughs> um and uh one day I was driving along doing the job that I was kind of doing at the time and thought I wonder how you be a comedian and I just rang the comedy club up and said how do you become a comedian it's a bit like a Judy Garland film, isn't it? Let's put the show on right here. <laughs> and uh, I said, how do you become a comedian? And they said, well, you've got to come down to an open spot, book me in, and that was it. And then I yeah. genuinely never looked back. You know, yeah. I did it, did it once, went brilliant. Second week was all right. Third week was good. And then I thought, that's it, I'm in now. So where did you do that open mic then? At the Frog and Bucket on right. Monday night. Was that, the, was that the Beat the Frog, was it? It was this predated Beat the Frog. It was called Red Raw. Right. And we it, this was in 1999, and we used to get a fiver for doing it. Right. We paid you to do an open mic. Right. And uh, so, used to get a fiver, and I used to, uh, much to my uh, shame, used to smoke then, and a fiver would get you a packet of fags. So I used to do right. well, it's a packet of fags, and you get up and and build up a bit of camaraderie with the, the, the some of the lads who were doing it then, who are still you know my friends now. Uh, particularly Mick Ferry, you know, we we both did every Monday night, and it was, yeah. you know, formative. And you know, you, you you'd you'd get tough audience, you get sparse audiences, and then some weeks for no reason, the place would be full on a Monday. And you think, what's going on? And there'd be yeah. some beer promotion on or something. So it was a good it was a good grounding. And then yeah. you get to meet other people, and it's it, it's it was less difficult than it is now to to start out. You know, you could pick gigs up all the time, and that's what mm -hmm. I did really. And I just. I absolutely went for it in the first year. I just, I didn't stop. No, I did. Uh, my, I did my, I did the frog and bucket. I did beat the frog, and did you? Did you beat the Sarah, Mill Sarah Millican was just was must have just been making her way because she she compared it, right? And uh, she was good, and I didn't, and and, and she come off and she come and stood next to me just by chance. Said, "Oh yeah, you're quite good. I think you're quite funny." And um, she went, "Yeah, thanks." And we just had a, a brief minute, and then it was my turn and. And we all went home, and um, but uh, what happened when you had your turn, though, I did all right. Yeah, I I, um, I didn't get any frogs. I, I no. went back and I did all right, and I didn't get any frogs. But then they did this thing called the, is it the Gilded Balloon, Justin? I entered the Gilded Balloon competition. So you think it, you're funny? Something like yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I did. I used to do this. I mean, I, I, I used to do this character called Joker Teller, as in Joke Teller. And, yeah. and I ran it past uh, Ted Robbins at Radio Lancashire, and he was like, oh, it's good, it's good, you've got to go and do it. Anyway, I went and did it. But the thing was, was that um, you had to just turn up ready. So I literally turned up as my character, and they were running behind. And um, I had to sit in the audience as my character for like <laughs> half an hour. And by the time I got up, I think people generally thought that I was this person. And uh, I, I died a slow death there, but I, I stuck at it a bit longer. But then... Uh, but but the priesthood got involved then. But it's not about me. It's about you. <laughs> but it's uh, happy happy memories. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, what correlations do you, do you see from stand up and preaching? Well, a lot of people say to me that uh, you know because I, before being a, a priest, they were like, "Oh, you're quite funny," and you know, and and you can. I bet you tell you some funny sermons. But I tend not to. I tend not to make my sermons funny. Actually, I, I try and get across a message. I try and make it practical, but. There's definitely a lot of humour in the church, that's for sure. I yeah, mean, I mean, there's about, something about... Go on. I mean, when I go to church, which is a, a rare occasion, I like a, a priest or a, or a minister or, or a vicar who can hold an audience. You know, I think you, that's the most important thing. It's not, you know, making them laugh or making them cry or... It's holding them and keeping them interested, mm -hmm. you know. 
winning winning the non-believers over i imagine at funerals and stuff like that and you know often you'll i've been to funerals of comedians or of theatrical funerals <laughs> we all give it a five star rating at the end you know how did the priest do you know and sometimes they know that there's comedians in and they try and be funny yeah went to one funeral once of a comedian friend and um they do this it was a humanist service and uh at, at the end the the uh the, the I don't know what you call them, the, the service taker, whatever you, you call them. Yeah. Fraud, I think you'd call them, wouldn't you? Fraud. Yeah, fraud we'd call, yeah. On the chin. Yeah, yeah. Chances. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> amateurs. He said, would anybody like to say any few words? And it was a, a place packed with comedians and everybody got up and did a bit. And it was, honestly, it was great. I mean, it went on so long that I had to go because I had to go back to go back and do a gig later on. People getting up doing five minutes, it was funny. I'll tell you something, Justin, there is some, I mean, there's some dark humour, but you, you've got to laugh at the moment with stuff going on, but there's some, it's rich with comedy. I mean, I'm, I've kind of maybe one day go, go back to it, but some of the people you meet, some of the stories. Mm. I, met, I did, a, I went to do, I can tell this because um, I'll not say any names, but there were basically a, a woman who had uh, this uh, woman come forward uh, for a baptism and the child's name had been tattooed on, on her arm. And the child was called um, Shalice, right? So yeah. I said, that's uh, that's an unusual name, is that, Shalice? Have that tattooed on your arm? And she went, well, what it was? She said, <laughs> tattoo, you know what's coming. Tattoo is spelt it wrong. And she said, uh, the baby were called Chelsea, but tattoo, tattoo is but Shalice. So instead of changing the tattoo, we changed the baby's name. And it's like, it's class. Actually, there's a story there, though, isn't there? I'd rather have an unusual name than a misspelled tattoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a choice in life, though, isn't it? It is, yeah. So, <laughs> listen, you're you're a comic, and you're we're in this grim lockdown. Um, how is it for somebody that's kind of in got funny bones to to keep uh, head above, keep your own head above the water during these uh, these times? Um, I think it's the same as everybody else, really. Uh, I, I don't really subscribe to that tears of the clown business. Yeah. Um, I think comedians have as many struggles with their kind of mood as, as everybody else does. But there is a thing possibly that we share with, with you and, and with doctors and with teachers that when you're in the public eye or whether when you're interacting with the public at vulnerable moments or at moments of high uh, emotional intensity, I mean, I'm talking myself up a bit now, you have to paint the face on, don't you? Sometimes you have to, you, you know, you have to do that. So there have been occasions when, you know, I've not felt great. The thing is, when I walk on stage, it's just it goes, it's fine. And when you come off, that's when it hits you again. Never have I been on stage where I've thought, oh, I'm not having a good time, or mm. God, I've not paid the gas bill, or mm. fallen out with somebody, or kids not you know it never occurs on stage it's it is actually a relief to go to work but specifically this uh this last um 12 months or or, or whatever i mean slightly before that i i've had a bit of a wobble i've had a bit of a tough time my dad died um a year and a half ago and uh i didn't actually deal with it i didn't deal with it at all you know people don't do this sometimes and uh, i'm the kind of person that I kind of deal with everything. I have loads of plates spinning and I'm fine with it all. And whatever life has thrown at me in the past, I've dealt with it and not bothered about it. I've been okay. And I've just, therapy has taught me. I've just shoved everything down and I've shoved it down and shoved it down and shoved it down. And eventually, you know, if you keep topping that up, it's going to spill out. Or if you want to use the analogy a different way, if you keep taking stuff away, you're going to run out of stuff. And I had a bit of a, I had a, well, I did. I, there's no point, there's no, there's no uh, reason to dress it up. I had a, a Bit of a breakdown, a mental health problem, um, just at the beginning of the world's global pandemic. So it was, it was, I picked the right time to have a bad time. Um, so literally, I did, and uh, I went for some therapy, saw my doctor, and struggled for a little bit. Um, so for me, I don't know whether it's been the pandemic that's uh, done my head in, or whether it's my own head that's been already. I wonder how I would have coped without the pandemic, but. What the pandemic has done, I keep, I'll stop saying pandemic shortly. What the pandemic has done, it's focused my mind on what's important and what's not important. And, 
and and to count your blessings and to and to do all that sort of stuff. And I kind of it's given me time to work through what I had to work through. Yeah. Give me time to reflect and to kind of, you know, have some medication and look after myself a bit and everything else. So did, that's me. Did you feel it creeping up on you that? Or or did or did it just land and think, oh, I can't go with this? Because I I think, what I think on reflection, like, it probably was creeping up on me, but I, yeah. the, the significant part of what I, I struggle with is the ability to know that I'm struggling. So I just shoved it all the way, shoved it all the way, shoved it all the way, and then when my dad died, something clicked and just... And, it, and, and there's, a, there's a lot more involved in that, because my dad, um, he wasn't actually my dad, he was my stepdad. I didn't, I didn't find this out on his death, but he wasn't that dramatic. <laughs> But it brought up a lot of other stuff, nothing to do with him, really, to, more to do with my own childhood and my own uh, father and, 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 and all that sort of stuff. And it kind of made me reflect on lots of stuff and possibly, possibly it made me reflect too much. I think sometimes, you know, you can navel gaze and consider mm. your own self far more important than your place in the world rather than, your, than the world in your place. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Did any of your mates notice that there was a change going on? I had a couple of mates who'd been through similar to me that kept saying, you, you know what, if you're struggling, let me know. And I'm going, I'm fine, I'm fine. And they're going, but I genuinely, I thought I was fine. And then, then I wasn't. So if you need anything, you come to me. And then by the time you go to them, it is, you've already gone through it and it is difficult. And it's a, it is a, a, a a thing about men and, and mental health and men of a certain age. I, I also turned 50 this year and there's a few, you know, I'm so classic, <laughs> you know, I, I present in a very atypical way. Um, it could have been a sports car. I mean, I've gone the other way. You see, this is the daft thing. You see, like I've reached middle age, you know, this is what's happened to me in the last 10 years in, in, as I approach middle age. You know, I, I gave up alcohol completely. I became completely vegan. I started exercising and going countryside walking. I've invested in an electric car. You know, these are not the, you know, these are not the marks of, of, a, of a middle-aged crisis, are they? A working class lad from Manchester. <laughs> well, it's not even that, is it? It's my age. I mean, it's, it's, it, I've been joking, actually, about this, about lockdown. People say, well, what about these people having affairs? How are they getting on? What about, who cares? What about the rest of us who are having to spend time with people that we're already living with? I'll tell you something, I'm not on Tinder or Plenty of Fish. You know, I'm on Right Move. That's my app of choice. I'm going on Right Move, I'm putting in what I want, where I want it, how often I'll, how much I'll pay, where I want it. And it's, it's brilliant. I, I fantasize about a flat in town living on my own. That's what I fa that's my fantasy. Love it. Great, Justin. So um, just going on to the stand-up stuff, Justin. So you you start, said you started the frog and, and bucket. How how quickly did that evolve for you? How, how long was it before you were doing? Because people who don't know about the frog and bucket, these were uh, Justin said he got a fiver, but generally there was not much money in the, those early gigs for people. No, no, no. Doing open mic sessions. What, did you get an agent quite quickly, or or what happened? Yeah, well, I. I I look back now on reflection and uh, so I keep saying reflection. I look back now and I think about the, these times and I got lucky quite quickly and I got some breaks. But the thing is when you get breaks and when you get chances, you've got to take them. You know, you, you get these handed to you, but you've got to go for them. So uh, within about eight or nine months, I met Peter Kay. And, um, and, and it was a bit funny really, because he was, he was just coming off the circuit. He was, you know, he was a bit of a legend then, and I'd been following him around the clubs and everything else, and I got introduced to him with, through a mutual friend, and everybody knew this was after he'd done that P2K thing, and everybody knew he was going to do the next thing, which would, would go on to be Phoenix Nights. And uh, I met him one night, and we got chatting, and he was lovely, and it was, you know, it was, uh, it was very nice to meet him. And the same night, I met Steve Edge there, who's been a, been a mate now for 20 years, and he's an absolute belting bloke. And, uh, and I said to Peter... I said, I'll tell you what, I said, I'd love to come for an audition for, for your show. Could I get an audition? And he said to me, he said, yes, you can. He said, because you're the only one that's asked me for an audition. Everybody else has asked me for a part. So he didn't know me for Adam. And I just wanted an audition just to see what it's like, just to see, you know, what the process would be to, to go and audition for something. And because I was always learning, I was still interested in and how you how you got. And I was 29 at the time, but and I thought, this is my last chance. 
you know, you think that. I think this, this is it. I haven't got, you know, I'm not going to go any further than... So I went for the audition, got the part. At the same time as I got the part in this TV show, um, I gave up my day job, which I was working part-time, uh, not part-time, temporary then, uh, doing temporary work. I gave up that up and they said, why are you not coming back in? I said, because I've got a part in a TV show. <laughs> six, late, six, six weeks later, I was out of work. Um, but sort of during that time, while we were filming Phoenix Nights, I'd reached the final of the City Life Comedian of the Year competition, which was a, a big deal, a competition that had been won by Peter and Johnny and uh, Carolina Hearn and Steve Cougar and all sorts of Dave Spike. Everybody had won it. It was this big, this big thing. And City Life was the listings magazine for Manchester. And the final that year was going to be held at the brand new comedy store. It, it only just opened. Uh, and on the way to the um, on the way to the final, I had this G Reg Sierra, and I was going down Hyde Road, and the back window fell out. It came off the arm and whoo, fell into the door, and I couldn't wind it up, and I had to park it down and take the car up with the black bin liner. <laughs> anyway, I was late. I get into the um, I get into the, the the venue, and everyone's there, the comics there. And when you get do these competitions, when you get in the final, they do a draw to find out the running order. And I said, I've, I said I missed the draw, and I was like, oh, here we go. I'm going on first year or last. Then they're not the best places to go. Anyway, they said, yeah, the, the running I was on the board and I looked up, I was on first after the break, which is, uh, for the listeners, I'm doing a chef's kiss. <laughs> um, it's this absolute sweet spot. It's the best bit, mm. best bit of the bill. And uh, I just think because I've been doing this thing, I was in this TV show and gigs were going well and the window in front of my car, I wasn't that bothered about stuff. And I just walked on. And I was just very relaxed. I had no time to worry about it. And, you know, being honest with you, I absolutely knocked it out of the park that night. Yeah. It was clear I was going to win. It was just one of those nights. Anyway, it comes off stage. The uh, show finishes. And um, Toby Foster tells me since who's a, the drummer in Phoenix Nights uh, and a breakfast host of Radio Sheffield, good, good man. He said to me, he said uh, that Don, the comedy store owner, had said, well, it's clear who the winner is. You lost someone out second and third. I'm going for a drink. So I won it. And then so I win it, go in the bar afterwards, and everybody's going, well done, well done. And Don from the comedy store and Charlotte from the comedy store come up to me and, and say, we'd like to look after you. So they they started looking after me and started putting me on at the comedy store. Within, within a year of being a stand-up, I've got representation. I'm getting weekends at the comedy store. I've won this thing, and I'm in the TV show. So... You know, things happened really quickly for me. But, you know, they ask you to do the comedy store and it doesn't matter who you are. If you can't do it, you're out on your ear. So mm. the pressure intensified then. And so I just worked hard. And I think that's what that's, that's what I did. If I'm, yeah, you know, if I'm honest with myself, I've spent a long time feeling a little bit, not great, not over grateful, but too thankful for the chances I got and not, not proud of the work that I put in to get them yeah. and when I got them. That sounds like a bit of therapy, Justin, because uh, <laughs> I, I've been there where, you know, it's about recognising what you've done and what you're, what you're achieving, isn't it? And, yeah. and it's having the, you know, I suppose there's a bit of the man thing coming in there. Just, so this, um, so you went for the audition and you... I think as well, I think it's not just a man thing because I think it's also a background thing. I yeah. think, you know, I come from a background where nothing was expected of me. And I'm not saying this in a disparaging way about the way I was brought up, but no kind of push. No. You know, no drive, no yeah. checking of my homework. You know, I look back now and I think the stuff that I do with my kids, and my mum had four kids and my dad worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They had no time for feelings no. and stuff like that. But so, you know, I never expected anything. And I, can't, I have massive imposter syndrome, mm. incredible amount of that, that when you get things and uh, you do a gig and you come off and you know you've done really well and you come in the dressing room and someone will go, that went well, and you go, yeah, you know. It, it's, a, you know, it's just embarrassing, really, to, to accept praise or to... Yeah. I wish I could be big headed because I see some people who are really successful in my business who are, who are rubbish. Ge I mean, genuinely, they're not very good, but they just talk a good game and they, they, they wheedle their way in, in mm. places and they yeah. self-publicize like you wouldn't believe. And it's, yeah. it's, it's difficult when you're self-deprecating like I am and like, you, you know, 
Yeah, I've seen it. Every, I've seen it every, everywhere I've worked. To be honest, yeah. Game. But it's uh, not just show business. So, if, if we can just touch on uh, the old Phoenix Knights, Justin, because yeah. they, that when you look back, I mean, uh, never mind the the pride, but the fun you must have had making that. Just that must have been extraordinary time for you, was it? What I mean, was, I've watched what, the outtakes DVD. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Justin, and I keep saying, to, I keep saying to my kids, you need to watch. Phoenix Knights, is it not on iPlayer or something? So they don't think it is, but... No, it's not, no. But just tell us about the, the making of it and the laughs you must have had. So the making of it was is it was interesting. So the, it, so what happens, <laughs> we, we all get the parts and, and most of them had already been in that Peter K thing and they'd done the, the stuff that he'd already that he'd already done. And, and so we all met for the first time at a read-through at Dukes 92 in Castlefield in Manchester. And... Uh, uh, we all sat around the table and we read the scripts out and you just read your bit and have a coffee and you chat to the director. And it, you know, normally these places are full of actors going, what are you doing, darling? Are you doing a session at Chichester? Yes, I've come up from town and doing this and this, this little tiny thing is going to be great. But we were all like, at what time do we have to get there? Do we have to bring our own dinner? <laughs> you know, how do we get paid? <laughs> we were asking all this sort of stuff. And um, and they were explaining it to us dead. And I said to them, I said, I've got this city life community year final. And they went, oh, that'll be fine. We'll work that out. I was like, yeah, who do I tell? They went, it's fine. We'll work that out now and, and everything. So that all happens. And then you get something that I've never done before. You get a call sheet. It tells you what time to turn up and, and everything else. And um, and so that was it. And we, we filmed it all in, in St. Gregory's in uh, Farnworth. And it was a, a, a real life working men's club, you know, open for a lot of the time we were there yeah. and um, because we all had small bits we weren't on camera a lot so but we were there often because you'd, you'd be in the background or yeah. you know you'd be in a scene or something else you, you, they weren't great big parts but we were in the fabric of the show so we would often be there all day and it was really handy because we would play cards or snooker or darts because we were in the club you know and and the best thing about telling what no one ever says when you James Judy Dench never goes on about this, but the best thing about telly is you get paid, right? You get paid to pretend all day. You get picked up. Somebody brings you to work, right? You, they pick your clothes out for you. They give you your breakfast and they give you your dinner. And if you're working out, they give you your tea. But even if they don't give you your tea, you have afternoon tea. They all lay sandwiches and cakes on. Mm. There's always brews going. It's perfect. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. And then they take you home. Yeah. And they pay you as well. Yeah. The, uh, but you know, even in the final cut, some of those shows, just in the laughter, is just about in the background. It's just yeah. about concealed, isn't it? Oh, just and weird things like, you know, we filmed at the Bonded Warehouse at Granada, which uh, is a big uh, building at Granada TV Studios, yeah. which they used to use for the studio tour. And we filmed in this room. It was right next door to where they filmed the Borrowers. So there was all big chairs and pianos and everything else. And we used to go and mess about in there because Archie Kelly, who's Kenny Senior, he's quite yeah. small and we used to put him on the piano still. Anyway, we were walking back and the, the, the floor was all creaky. And they said, uh, camera turning, quiet please. So we have to stand still. And we stood still and I feel my leg going warm. And I look around and Archie Kelly peed on my leg. <laughs> and I couldn't say anything because they were filming right there. Yeah. The man is a weirdo, I'll tell you that for nothing. And do you know what? You're a weirdo. <laughs> Justin, I think, I don't know, I might be wrong, but I mean, the script, the, the characters were, were just gems. But I actually think what you talked about there, the fact that you're kind of, people just ask for a part and, you know, you were one of the few that actually had an audition. Do you think that actually made it, gave it that extra warmth, that there was that bit of naivety about it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, um, it, I remember so, uh, no, more than one occasion we would do something and uh, do a take. And very often the first take isn't what they use. They'll use the third one or the fourth one. They might not use the fifth one. They might go back and use the second one. But you do it a few times from different angles. And we'll be doing something. We do something and uh, the director would go, cut, really funny that. Do that again. It was really funny. And Peter would beat it. We'd go, whoa, don't tell them they were funny because then they'll just try and do that again. You know, so a lot of it was uh, just the natural thing. And because we were all comedians, and you see that uh, with Peter, and, and, and also I've worked with um, Ken Loach as well, and he does the same thing. He employs 
comedians and natural performers. Mm. I think there's a realness that if you, you just let them be, plus mm. they're not very good actors, so we're not pretending to do anything. Didn't have many lines. No. It wasn't and, hard for me to look gormless. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but, but after that, um, everybody who was in Phoenix Nights pretty much careers just went like that, didn't they? Or, or kind of fame, if that's the right word. I remember uh, you weren't on it, but the, uh, the rest of the guys did. I think it was jumping on the bandwagon tour. Yes. And, and yeah, you know, yeah, they did. But, yeah. And they were great. But the, the thing that, I mean, because I, you know, I, because I've dabbled with stand up, I do, I, I, so I, I hate myself for it sometimes. I sit there and watch it for the art and I don't want to get all arty-farty, but I watch it for the craft and the skill and I, mm -hmm. and I love that listening. But the, I've, I've been to so many stand-up shows and gigs, but those gigs, you just feel the warmth, the love of the audience, don't you? And yeah. when I came to see you, um, I, again, it was that, that warmth towards you. And I don't know whether it was a Northern thing, it, whether it was kind of Northerners cheering on Northerners, but it, it's, there, it must've been exceptional times and everybody's career just blossomed, didn't they, from that from that show? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, it's hard to, to sort of uh, separate, you know, what people lo love about Phoenix Nights and, you know, what they like about you. And I hope to, and I do think that I've sort of carved my own thing away from it now. And I'm not, you know, saying... It's funny, when you go on Radio Manchester and you get somebody who was in Brookside 15 years ago and they're doing a play in Bury and they go, I don't want to talk about Brookside. You think, why are you here then, mate? <laughs> we wouldn't have you on if you weren't in Brooks anyway. But it was what what was amazing was when we went back five or six years ago, we did those shows at the arena. We did like the 15-year anniversary mm -hmm. and we did some shows for Comet Relief two weeks. That was incredible. That was like the closest I'll ever get to being a rock star. You know, 15,000 people in every night. You couldn't get a ticket for love and the money. No. You know, and just the wave of, you know, the show, the the, the, the screen, the arena went dark and it went ding, 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 ding. ding. And it went, it went and that was amazing. That was, that was, mm. that was special. Yeah. To be back with the lads and, and the girls, just special time just to yeah and what's your spin on it justin do you, do you think it finished went at the right time or do you think there was a i know dave spike has said the christmas shows and things like that but do you, do you think there was a, a bit more mileage in it um i think it's perfect i think i think i think two series of it was just perfect they told two stories um People still watch it and still love it now. I think maybe maybe you could have done three. Maybe we could have done Christmas specials. If they asked me, if they ever go back and do it again, would I do it? Of course I would if I got asked, definitely. But, you know, I'd hate, I'd hate to be in something that went on too long. Mm. Um, it's better to do something real, you know, too short. People people love it. You know, it, it, it kind of... I sometimes think that it kind of missed out a little bit by being on Channel 4 originally and the office came out at a similar time so the sort of during the award ceremonies we got overlooked a lot i think the office took a lot of the plaudits and mm. that changed a lot of things for, for a lot of people there and um, maybe i don't know maybe channel four don't push for awards and things the same as other channels do mm. and maybe that's was the case but i mean you know, now Peter's a you know mega star. You know, he's he's so famous. But then he wasn't. He wasn't. You know, he wasn't huge then. So it was definitely um, it was definitely the the single most important thing I've ever done. Yeah, and I suppose I, I, this is not, I'm not that fussed about this question because I think I know the answer. But people listening might be. And is and is he still the same diamond geezer he was back then? Peter. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, because I don't see him. You know, no. I was never pally with him. Uh, you know, the occasions that I have seen him, he's been fine with me. And, you know, like I said, we spent a bit of time um, at the arena shows, but not really very close to, no. to him anyway. Never have been. And and I think he has his own set of friends. And I think when you're that famous as, as he is and that successful, that, you know, that's, that you know, it separates you sometimes from things. Yeah. But I'm not... I'm not bothered about that because I'm not. I'm not even bothered, right? I don't no, care. No, <laughs> but no. he wasn't. He what? We were never close anyway. So no, it's not like I've no, lost a mate. But I'm really still very close with Paddy and with Steve 
and with Archie and with Toby, you know, with the, the, that the core of us, mm. and Neil, you know, we're very, very close. I supported yeah. Dave on tour once. Uh, I don't see much of Dave anymore. He, you know, he's, I mean, everyone's a bit older now, you know, everyone's... About 90 now, isn't he, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I listen to his uh, stand up and he says, My granddad was, and I think, Your granddad? Your granddad must have been in black and white, mate. Um, you know, that's, so just, that. that's just reminding me because uh, we did a, we did a, I, I do some, I do a bit of, com I haven't done it for youngs, but I did a bit of comedy with my mate who's a priest. And we had uh, Jimmy Cricket come in and do a show, and he, he does, <laughs> in his set, he does these letters from his mammy. Yeah. <laughs> I think Jimmy's about, 72, 73. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, He's Jimmy. always working, isn't he? Always working. Oh, I, I love Jimmy. He's such a lovely guy. But yeah. anyway, let's get back to you. So you, you've, you've, you know, out of all this, you've had a fantastic stand-up career. I just want to ask a bit about the, you know, I'd say I love the craft of uh, writing and stuff. I did, I did actually write a little bit for Spikey uh, for one of yeah. his shows, which was like a joy for me. But when you're, when you're writing, uh, Justin. What what's the template? Is it are you are you picking up stuff as you're going about your life? Do you sit so, down? You know, I have uh, have my phone, so I'm if voice notes are often a thing, um, and then I've just started doing something. I'm very lucky uh, a couple of years ago to work with Henry Normal, he yeah. was the uh, poet and the former head of Baby Cow, and he he directed my Edinburgh show, show that you saw actually. He helped put that together with me. Uh, and he gave me the best bit of advice that I've ever had doing stand-up. He said, you, everybody said, the, the, you, you all, everybody does this. You, you're writing a new show and you think, I've got to write some new material. I've got to get a new hour together. You think, right, I'm going to approach it business-like. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to sit at my desk at 9 o'clock, 9.30, cup of tea on, turn everything off. Maybe have radio for on in the background, just bubbling away so you feel like you're, you're being, you know. He said, but, he said, what are you going to write about? Nothing's happened. So he says he always writes at night, and that's what I do now. So I make sure that I always write down stuff that's happened in the day. So just some funny things, and I look mm -hmm. at my notes, I listen to my phone thing, I just remember the things I've done and thought, what was the funny thing in that today? What was today's story? Mm -hmm. So today's story might be that, you know, I talked to a priest on the internet. <laughs> it, you know, that could be the jumping off point for something, and then that'll be a thing, and then I'll work on that. Yeah. Um, it could be, you know, it could be anything. And then that's what I do. And then I sort of, I look at my stuff all the time as I'm talking about it and I try out on stage and I slip it into old routines and I put it in the middle of other stuff. And then it's almost um, organic. A theme will come. Because yeah. often there's a theme to the, to the shows and that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm working on, uh, I'm working on some idea at the moment of um, being stuck in the middle. That's my kind of uh, jumping off point where I'm, you know, not probably more than middle aged, but um, I'm a member of a gym and I go to one gym in a really posh area. I live right in the middle of the two branches and another gym, which is in a right skanky area. And I compare and contrast the things that go on in both the gyms and where do I, where do I fit? And actually I don't fit in either. And I don't think anybody fits right. in any pigeonhole. But we're always trying to, so that's what I'm working on at the minute. And then if you take that as a template, if you take that as your sort of central theme, you can find, mm. you know, like writing a sermon, isn't it? It's a bit mm. radio full thought for the day, isn't it? And uh, I think life is a little bit like that, doesn't it? You know, so that's what I do. And then um, for me, I write on stage more than anything. So if I was writing a new show for Edinburgh, about now I'd have 20, 25 minutes of new material. And uh, I need to get that to an hour before the 1st of August. Mm. So I'd be doing it on things and I'll be doing the first kind of rough previews around March, April, and then into May. And then at the start of June, I'll be doing at least between, in June and July, I do 30 one hour previews and do the show 30 times. And, and hopefully by show 30, it'll be 20 times better than it was show one. And then I, I aim to have the show ready for the first night in Edinburgh. And the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is very important mm. uh, for us. It's our showcase and everything else. And then I'd get that ready and then off I go. And then it doesn't really change much. So I have that solid hour, which then I take on the road. And then over six, 12 months of doing that in clubs, it changes and grows and 
becomes more dynamic and you drop some bits and things like that. But yeah. try not to put too much new stuff in there because you're wasting, you're wasting it. You know, you might as well keep it for the next show. So yeah, that's what I do. That's what I try and do. And um, but I don't sit at the desk every day and, and write jokes because that doesn't work for me. I just no. observe things. Yeah, I look at things and observe. <laughs> And then try and tell them in a funny way. That's what I try and do. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be quite controversial here because I'm. I think we're a bit bereft of proper funny comics on the telly at the minute. Mm-hmm. Um, who, who, who's who's good out there in normal? Well, you know? I'll say this: that I don't think that there's anybody that's made it, um, you know, on telly that isn't good, that hasn't kind of put the hours in. You know, some have got lucky and some have have, have done well and one thing, but most of the big names. So your Michael McIntyre's, your John Bishop's, your Jason Manford's, Sarah Millican, Dara O'Brien, John Bishop, trying to think of some of the others, John Richardson, these guys, uh, Ramesh, you know, Rob Beckett, these guys regularly were incredible on the circuit. You know, they were brilliant. So no one in that gang has ever, you've never gone, oh, he's only made it because he's got a good agent. He's only made it because he's got, Mm. you know, the the right connections. She's made it because she's a woman. He's made it because he's Asian. He fits that because, you know, that there are accusations of tokenism. And it's a kind of, there's very, it's it's, it's quite meritocratic. Is that the crown round? Yeah. Yeah. Stand up. It is is that, I mean, having a good agent helps and, Mm. Getting some breaks helps, and being a little snivelling little weasel helps sometimes, <laughs> and bigging yourself up helps sometimes. But in the end, what is success? You know, success is being happy in what you do. Mm. Absolutely, there's no way of shaking that off for me. How long has that taken you to get to that point? Have you always felt that? Was that something that's come? Now you're at that middle point. I, um, the minute I could pay my bills being a stand-up comedian, I'd made it. That was a success. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I'm not without ambition, and I, and I don't feel like I've overachieved. You know, I definitely think that I've, there's potential for me still, and I've still got things that I want to do. I've still got targets and goals and dreams and, and everything else. But actually, I love what I do. I, I adore my job. You know, and and for me that is success. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I'm I'm just mindful of time, and, and but I just like. I wonder. I was going to ask you to be honest. What's that? What is that? Is it to do arenas? But I'm not. I'm no. Not, I'm not a no. fan of arenas. I'm just not a fan of them. Don't if like I them. could, if I could do a hundred dates on tour in decent sized venues every year, mm. that'd do me. Mm. If I could do a hundred uh, Berlin mechanics a year. That's fine, because the rest of the stuff that I do is all right. I do bits on the radio. I do other corporate work, a bit of acting. Um, I mean, I'm not saying I'd, I'd never do an arena, but that's not the ambition. The ambition is to play in those theatres. I mean, the the uh, Bur- I think Burnley's about 600. You get in there, but playing theatres like I did last year. I did the Lowry, and I sold 1,500 tickets in the big room, and it was just yeah. It's that's that's as good as it gets. That's perfect for stand-up comedy. Yeah. Any more than that, and you, you've got to adjust for laughter. Yeah. It must well, be listen, something about doing an arena and seeing seeing somebody falling over with a bucket of popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, it's been it's been absolutely great having you. I've wanted you to come on for ages, and um, I know. So I've been rubbish. I've I? Come on, because I, I just like you. I think you're a really nice guy. You're so down to earth, and you know, if you ever want to. If you fancy playing a church sometime and you want to try out one of your yeah. sets and you can just mind your P's and your Q's in for just, you know, <laughs> you're very welcome yeah. to St. Matt's because it's a beautiful church. Watch your P's and your Q's when you're in the pews. And we've done we've done a few gigs there in uh, Tony Vino. I've done, gigs so you... before. I've done gigs before in churches. I've done Halifax Minster. That's, All right. Uh, you know, big time. Yeah they're, yeah, they're great venues. But, um, you know. Well, they're you... built for it, aren't they? Pardon? They're built for it. Yeah, they're built for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just don't have a bar. That's the only problem. I said, I don't drink. It's all fine. Uh, I mean, you know, um, <laughs> I said, one of my favourite bands is Bell and Sebastian. All right. And um, I, I saw them at the Cathedral in Manchester a few years ago. 
And the uh, singer says, uh, you know, he says, we have to be mindful of our surroundings. There are certain stipulations that we've agreed to. So there are certain songs that are off the, the, uh, the roster tonight. He said, but thank God for, um, thank God for an allergy, the songwriter's friend. <laughs> So yeah, I can I can allude to things. That's what I can do when I yeah. see you. Yeah. But yeah, I'll definitely come up and see you. And uh, hopefully we'll be back at Turf Moor watching you almost beat us, but not quite, please. Yeah. Well, hopefully you stay in the Premier League. I think we will. I think we'll be all right. You better, you better, because yeah. it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a great trip. Yeah. It's great coming to, to Old Trafford as well, because we've turned you over there. Uh you know, J. Rodriguez super goal last year. It was one, one that lives. Well for you, in it. <laughs> you like pointing at electricity, don't you? Things like that get excited. <laughs> you know, I never. This is true that I, I, when I went to watch you once, and I heard the Burley fans singing, "He's one of our own, J. Rodriguez. He's one of our own." I generally thought they were being ironic because I thought, "Oh, he must be from Panama or something." He's actually from Burnley, isn't he? He is. His dad's called Kiko. <laughs> He played. Yeah, he's, not a, he's not a Burnley name, Rodriguez, is it? It's not really, no, no. But no. I think he's. I think his dad, his dad was a decent footballer. His dad played for. I don't know if you remember Cole Dynamos. This was going back. I do know about Cole Dynamos because yeah. I was a Hyde United fan, and they absolutely. They were like a. They were like a boy's own story, weren't they? Yeah, they had this owner called Chalky White who. Uh, yeah. Turned them all professional, and then um, just before one season, I think the season was about to start, and he just said, "I've had enough of this." About 86, wasn't it? 86, 87, something like that. Oh, I remember it. Jacked, jacked and, uh, yeah. I think Alan Ka Alan Kennedy, who, who won the European Cup yeah. um, with Liverpool, he, he, he saw his final days, I think, at Colm, but there we go. Mad, in it? Right, my friend, I'm off to do a Zoom quiz. God bless you, brother. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I'll see you soon, mate. Take care. See you. Ta-da. Cheers.